First thing I want to say, uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Uh, I wish my father was here. He's up in heaven, but I'm just, you know, again, thank all the fathers out there. I just want to have Father's Day. Now, I used to work at a state farm, and I, I worked in the auto claims department. And my job title was a claim specialist. And uh, my job was to make decisions on liability or denials if we was going to repair or only partially repair your vehicle. That was part of my job. Now, uh, part of my job was making liability decisions. And when I made liability decisions, it's say two cars that was in an accident, a bodily accident. Let me give you a good example. Say if there was two cars headed in the same direction, one in front and one behind, and they were stopped. And just say the, the vehicle was in front, all of a sudden put their vehicle in reverse, and they backed into the vehicle that was behind. That was behind. Now, in this situation, uh, there was two, uh, things that I would do to get information from the vehicles behind. I would get two recorded statements, one from our insured and then one from the claimant. Then, if there was an eyewitness, I'd get a recorded statement from them, but the eyewitness couldn't know either party. If there was any video, I would get a copy of the video. If there was any photos showing the damage, I would get a copy of, of, of the damage. Now, I would take all this evidence, and then, once I came to a conclusion, I will make a liability decision, and I will explain to them what happened. Now, a couple questions I would ask the vehicle behind. How far was the vehicle in front of, uh, front of you? Uh, I would say the size of your car, car lengths. And they were like, uh, three or four car lengths away from me. I'm like, okay. Now, when they put the vehicle in the back, reverse, they, was they going fast or were they going slow? And they were like, oh, they backed up slow. I said, all right, it was three or four car lengths away. And it was going slow, backing up slow. Now, did you honk your horn to let the person in the front know you was behind them? No, I didn't. Okay, so there was three or four car lengths away from you. There was space between. They backed up slow. Then you didn't honk your horn. Then I come up with the conclusion, all right, so you are now going to have a percentage of the accident. Now, the hardest thing for a claim specialist to do is tell somebody they got a percentage of the pie. That's the hardest thing to do. So, me and me as a claim special, I probably give them 20, 30 percent of the accident. And then when I call them and I tell them, I say, hey, you, you're going to have 20, 30 percent of the fault for this accident. And, they put, and the first thing they're going to say, that person hit me. I said, yes, you're correct. They hit you. And they're going to have majority at fault for this accident because the person who's backing up has to bring the duty. You're right. But, you told me they was three or four car lengths away from me. You also told me they backed up slow. Then you also told me you didn't hump your horn. You also have a duty to prevent the accident. So since you didn't prevent the accident, I have to put 23rd percent on you for this accident. Now, now, church, today my topic is going to be about what's your percentage of the pie? God, I just want to thank you for today, and uh, again, thank you for allowing all the fathers who are here, and, and then uh, also, uh, happy Father's Day, and God, just uh, watch over our pastor, and, and, uh, and who's over in Israel right now, and, and just visit the Holy Land, and God, just give me the words to say, and, 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 and open up the ears and the hearts of the people, and I just thank you. Now, I am coming from the book of Genesis. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1 and 13. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God has made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat, eat the fruit from trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You, uh, the serpent said, you will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will open. And you will be like, a, be like God, knowing good for me. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for the food and pleasing of the eye, and also desirable of gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her 
and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed some fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God and as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the trembling of God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the, in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree that I ate. And then Eve said, Then the Lord God said to, to the woman, What is this you have done? And, the, and Eve said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now, in this situation, before Adam and Eve ate from the tree uh, at the center of the garden, they had a good life. I mean, really, they had a perfect life. Yes, they had, you know, work the fields, they had to do work. I mean, that's, that's just human nature. You've you got to take care of what you, you own. But they had a good life. Now, when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the garden, did you see, they said their eyes opened. They started to realize, and they realized, you know, once they ate the egg, egg, egg from the tree, they, they came like God. They knew evil from uh, right, right from evil, good. They understood this. Now, instead of Adam and Eve taking full responsibility for the part they played in this, in this situation, what did Adam and Eve do? Adam, he blamed God. Eve blamed the serpent. Not one time they took responsibility for the part they played in this situation. They didn't accept their percentage of the pie. Now, of course, both of, both of them were wrong in this, of the action. Now, one thing that I learned, accepting your percentage of your pie is one of the hardest things to do. Church, I don't know about you, but I know about me. It's hard for me to accept my percentage of the pie. It's hard for me to admit that I was wrong. I don't, it don't matter if it was 20, it don't matter if it was 30, or 40, or even 5%. It's hard for me to come to somebody and say, hey, I was wrong for the percentage I played in this situation. I don't know about y'all, but I do know me. <laughs> now, one of the things you have to do, you gotta swallow, swallow that bullet called pride. If you don't swallow that bullet, it's gonna be hard you accept seventy percentage. Another thing you gotta do, you gotta humble yourself. And if you don't humble yourself, you won't accept your percentage. Proverbs eleven and two, it states this: When pride comes, <laughs> then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. Let me say that again: When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with this, but with humble. It's wisdom. I know y'all heard this saying, pride comes before the fall. Now, again, you have to swallow your, the bullet called pride. Now, it's definitely hard to humble yourself. It's hard to sit there and say, hey, I have a percentage in the pie. Luke 14, 11 states this, for everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and who humble himself will be exalted. Now, when you swallow that bullet called pride and when you humble yourself, another thing you gotta do, you gotta go apologize to the person who you offended. Even if that person was majority at fault for this act, for, for what happened in the situation, you still gotta go to them and say, hey, with this part right here, I'm sorry. Let me give you an example. Say if it was a married couple. One spouse started the situation. One spouse started the argument. And the other spouse uh, didn't, uh, uh, say the other spouse didn't do what they were supposed to do. All right, let me change this up for a married couple. Say if the man started the argument. Say if the man did something stupid 
and the wife was mad. So the, the man, he, he started he started the situation, right? Instead of the wife confusing the situation, she decided to put wood on the fire. All right, I, I know y'all, you know, uh, you know, like a bonfire. You know, like you have a bonfire, and, and one thing, I, I have watched my wife do this time and time again. She's good at making bonfires. She'll take little twigs, she'll, she'll put them up like in a pyramid, and, and, then she, and then she'll put paper in between the twigs and she'll set each paper on fire. And then and all of a sudden, the fire will happen. But one thing about little twigs, they only burn for so long. Then you have to go get a bigger log and put it on top of the twigs. The more logs, bigger logs you put on it, the longer the, la the fire lasts. And if you want to last for a long time, you got to put a bigger log on it. Now, again, the husband started the fight. The husband did something stupid. But the wife, instead of diffusing the situation, she decided to keep adding wood to the fire. <coughs> now you got a situation. You got the, uh, the husband who's mad, now you got a wife who's mad. And they're going at each other. Instead of looking at this situation, now the husband, he was wrong. Now the wife is wrong also. Yes, the husband has majority of the percentage of the pie. That's, I agree with you on that. But the, husband, the wife didn't defuse the situation. She kept antagonizing and doing stuff to make, make the situation go longer. Now, Matthew 5 and 23, 24 states this. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come offer your gift. I don't know how many times I had to go to Janelle and said, I'm sorry. I don't know how many times I had to humble myself, swallow that bullet called pride and go to her and say, hey, for this, I'm sorry. I was wrong for that. Even if, if Janelle was in the majority of fault, it's hard, it's hard for me to go and say, for this part right here, I'm sorry. Now, in this situation, you got you get one thing you gotta realize, it's much easier to blame other people for you for what happened. I don't know about you. I don't know how many times I blamed somebody for the circumstances I was in. It's much easier to blame others and say they are at fault for this. I don't have any skin in the game. Now, let's, let's go back and look at Genesis 1, uh, 1, 12, and 3. The man said, and that's Adam, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. Did, did y'all see that? <laughs> Adam said, the woman you put here with me gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. Adam is blaming God. He's talking to God right now. You, you the one gave me this woman. I didn't ask for her. <laughs> I, I was minding my, my business. I was, uh, uh, you know, take care of the animals. I was uh, taking care of the plants, and you decided to give me a woman. Now it's your fault. You get, you want to give it to me. Now, let's look at Eve. Then the Lord God said to the woman, He told to Eve, "What is this you have done?" And the woman said, "The serpent deceived me, and I." Ate. Now she's talking about the serpent. She said, the serpent deceived me. Yes, people can deceive you. Yes, that can happen. But the question is, what decision you make when they're trying to deceive you? Well, she ate. Now, in this situation, when, when, when both of them ate, see, see first, uh, that's why the serpent went to the Eve to show Adam it's all good. And once Adam saw it was all good, that's when he ate. He saw if nothing happened, then that's when he ate. And so of course Adam's going to get majority of the pie. Now, in this situation, both of them was at fault. They had a percentage of the pie. Both of them had a percentage. Adam had a percentage and Eve had a percentage. But again, it's much easier to blame somebody else for it. Blame them 
just like Adam blamed Eve, I mean God blamed uh, uh, Adam blamed God, and Eve blamed the serpent. It's much easier not accept your percentage of pie and blame somebody else. Even if you have fault for the situation, even if you made the decision to do whatever you wanted to do, it's much easier to blame somebody else. The blame game. You know what the blame game looks like? You pointing your finger at somebody else, but you got three fingers pointing back at you. That's the blame game. You pointing your fingers at somebody else, saying they are at fault for the situation you're in, but not realizing you got three fingers pointing back at you. Now, this is kind of like a situation. Say, say if you've been in a relationship, you've been in a bunch of relationships, they always end bad. You've been married three, four times, and they always end bad. And every time the relationship ends, the person say, it's the other person's fault why this person relationship ends. I'm like, well, what about the other relationship? It's their fault, too. So you're going to sit here and tell me you had nothing to do with these relations, other relationships? No. They, they the one got the attitude. They the one got the problem, not me. They're blaming others. Instead of them looking at step, looking up in the mirror and saying, what did, what is, what, why does this keep happening? Why I will keep getting divorced? Why this relationship keep, ain't a bad? Is there something that I'm doing that keep causing this? But again, it's much easier to blame somebody else. Now, Again, like, like I said, the blame game is like pointing your fingers at somebody who got three fingers pointing you back, back. Now, Matthew 7, verse 3 and 5, it say, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own, your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me, talk, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It's easy to point at somebody and say, you the problem. It's easy to point and say, you need to take the log, you need to take the speck out of your eye. Especially when you don't see the log in your own eye. And in at, at reality, some people do see the log, the speck, the log in the eye. They just don't want to admit it. Or live in the denial. Now, one thing that I have found out and that I learned in my lifetime, taking that full responsibility, whatever part you played in that situation, it's hard to do. One thing that I found out that I learned is accepting your percentage of the pie. It's hard to do. One thing that I found out that I learned, going to another person and saying, I'm wrong, I was wrong for this. That's hard to do. I don't know about you, church, but it's hard for me to do. Now, I want, I want y'all to do me a favor. When you go home today, if you don't get anything out of the sermon, when you go home today, I want you to go home and look yourself in the mirror. I want you to go home and ask yourself, all these situations that I, I, I'm in or have been in, did I have something to do with it? Because you got to remember, you, can't, you can lie to other folks, but you can't lie to yourself because you live with yourself. Ask yourself, this situation right here, did I have any, anything to do with that situation? Did I make any decision to, kept, to keep causing this situation? Did I do anything? And if you can't come up to something, ask God. And I guarantee he will reveal it to you. You might not like what he revealed. <laughs> you, you, might, you might live in denial. I don't know how many times I lived in denial. But God will reveal it to you. Amen. And he will say, this little part right in him out of this 5%, that little 5% kept causing, the, kept causing the situation. If you didn't do that 5%, it would have been it. So do me a favor. Go home and truly look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, 
All these things that happened to me, did I have something to do, do with it? Do I have any skin in the game? Now, uh, let's talk about decision making. It don't matter if it's a good, it doesn't matter if it's a, a good or bad decision. Every action is going to be a reaction. When I, when I used to coach and, and train athletes, and I used to always tell them, every good is going to be, every action is a reaction. Let me give you an example. Say if that wall was right there was a brick wall, and I decided to go over there and hit the wall as hard as I can with my fist. The action is, I'm punching the wall. You know what the reaction is going to be? That wall is going to be punching me, come punching right back into me. Wherever how much force I put into that wall, it's going to be forced back into me. So every action is a reaction. So if you decide to make a, a good decision, it's going to be a good reaction. If you decide to make a bad decision, it's going to be a bad reaction. Let me, get, let me, let me, let me explain this to you so you understand. Say if you was out at the bar with your friends. And one of your friends had the car that was been drinking. And they been drinking heavily. And standing you taking the keys from said, I'm, I'm gonna drive, I'm gonna drive us home. The person, you, you allow that person been drinking to get in the car and drive. And then you get in an accident. Say, say if you was badly injured. The easiest thing to do in this situation is to blame the person who been drunk. Yes, they got majority at fault. But one thing you gotta remember. That person made a decision to get in the car with them. Now they got skin in the game. Now they have a percentage of the pie. Every action is a reaction. So you make a good or bad decision, it's going to be a reaction behind it. And, and one of my friends told me something about this. He told me uh, 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 yesterday, and he said, whatever decision you make, sometimes it's only affect you. It, it affects you people who come behind you. It can be a generation curse. So if you have kids, it's so like if I say if I do something, it can become a curse and affect the generation after generation. Now, Leviticus 5, chapter 5, verse, it states this. When anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what they have sinned. When anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in any of these matters. Just like the prodigal son. You remember the pro prodigal son? He, son he, he left his father and he told his father, I don't want nothing to do with you. He had all kind of money. He went and left and spent all this money. Wild living, wild, all that stuff. And he left. And then he found himself in a hog pen with the pigs. And it's so funny, when he was sitting there, eating with the hogs, how he came to himself. And he realized, my servants, my father's servants eat better than this. He came to himself. He became aware that, they were, that he was guilty. And uh, in verse Samuel, verse 25 and 24 states this, she fell at his feet and said, I accept all the blame in this matter, my Lord. Please listen to what I have to say. This woman, she humbled herself. This woman accepted her, her, her accept, accept the bullet called pride. She humbled herself and she fell to his feet and she said, I accept all the blame in this matter. She didn't point the finger at nobody else. She didn't blame anybody else. She didn't do anything. She didn't say somebody else was at fault. She said, I accept all the blame. Sometimes I can hear my kids upstairs arguing, going at each other. The two older daughters, they're going at each other. And I'm like, in a few minutes, they're going to be down here Come and say, blame each other for what happened. I could hear, I was like, oh boy, they here, here they come. Do, 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 do. Daddy, 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 she did this, daddy, she did that shit. And I, and I said, wait a minute. Before you tell me 
what she did and what she did, I need you to explain what did you do. Don't explain to me what the other sister did. I need you to explain what part that you played in this situation first. Then after you tell me that, then you can tell me what the other sister did. And it stops them in the track. Now they realize, oh yeah, I did this. Yeah, I, I started it, this and that. And then another sister, yeah, she started it and I, and I started to, to hit back or do something back. Now they realize they had a percentage in the pie. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes you're not going to have any skin in the game. Sometimes the other person is going to be 100% up on Just say if it's a young lady walking down the street, mind her own business, and then some, some guy attacks her and takes advantage of her. She had nothing to do with that. Say if you, you, drive, you got in your car and so I'm going to go on a joy ride, and you are, are, are following the rules of the road, you follow the rules, and somebody looking at their phone, texting or, or, or on my phone driving hits you. You had nothing to do with that. Sometimes you're not going to have any skin of that. Sometimes you're not going to have percentage in, uh, in the pocket. Now this is a hard, a hard part. Even if you have a percentage of the pie, sometimes other folks are going to blame you for everything. Even if it was two people and you had a percentage of the pie, sometimes other people are going to say, no, you 100% have wrong for this situation. Let me read John uh, 8, verse 1 and 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. He sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in this woman. They called her an adultery. They made her stand before the group. And they said this to Jesus. Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They was using this to question it as a trick, as a trap, in order to have a basis of accusing him. But Jesus bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw the first stone at her. Again, he still, he, again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. Older ones first until only Jesus and, and the lady was left. And Jesus straightened up and he asked her, woman, where are thy? Has no one condemned you? And the lady said, no one, sir. And she said, and Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your sin life. Now in this, this situation, she was wrong. In this situation, yes, yeah, she had a percentage of the pot. She committed adultery. She, she did a wrong act, yes. But the problem I have in this situation, where's the man at? Why did he only brought her? Why did they bring him? They only brought her, but didn't bring him. She was wrong for what she done. And last time I checked, it takes two to tangle. <laughs> last time I checked. But they only broke he and her. They was condemning her. In the book Law of Moses, they was correct. She was supposed to be stolen. They was correct about that. See, sometimes this world, whatever percentage you played, 
in a situation. Sometimes this world is going to condemn you for it. Sometimes this world is going to say, you're a bad person. You're no good. Sometimes this world is going to bring you down. Like on social media or, 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 or the, camp, the council coaching. And you can play the small percentage, but they make your percentage bigger than the others. Now, one thing I love about this situation, how Jesus acted. How Jesus said, those without sin cast the first stone. And did you realize the older from the youngest started dropping their stone? The only two people was left standing there was Jesus, Jesus and her. The crowd, the social media, the, the, the council culture, all of them left. There was nobody there to condemn her for what she done. Yes, she had a percentage in the pocket. And I love how Jesus looked at her and said, asked her, where the people at? Where the people at who condemned you? And she said, no one, no one here, sir. Jesus was like, where, where the people who, who, who said you was a bad person and because you just committed adultery? Where are they at? She's like, they're not here, sir. And how Jesus looked at her and said, Tony, I don't condemn you. Leave and leave your sin life alone. Because see, sometimes, even if you have a percentage by the outside people is just going to blame you. And that ain't right. But knowing you have a father up in heaven who's going to show you mercy. You have a father in heaven who's going to show you grace. That's right. Now, church, these are some of the steps you're going to need to follow by accepting your percentage of the pie. And I know it's like being the dead horse. You're going to have to swallow that book called pride. You're going to have to humble yourself. Trust me, if you don't humble yourself, God will. Just like the prodigal son who was eating with the homies. He was hungry. Then when you uh, accept your uh, potential, then when you uh, swallow the book called pride on yourself, then you're going to have to accept the percentage you played in, in the role, the part actually you played. You're going to have to accept it. Then you got to confess. You can't accept unless you're going to confess it. Then, whoever you did the person offense, you got to go and ask for forgiveness. I remember this one time. I was sitting in the PA room, uh, you know, uh, with, with the mics, you know, that's the room that people, you know, work the mics and microphones and things like that, and music, whatever, if it needed to be loud, whatever. I was sitting in that room, and, um, and I think I was about 17 years old. And, uh, and at that time, I wouldn't live in how I was supposed to be living. And see, my father was, was, a, was, a, was a pastor. And, uh, and so the people of the church was getting on my dad well, about how I was living. And they would come to my dad. I saw your son out on the streets doing this. I saw your son doing this. I saw your son doing that. I mean, over and over again. See, it didn't hurt me. Because I wasn't taking a beating. But see, my dad was taking a beating for me. So it didn't hurt me. Now, my dad would come and say something to me, but then it didn't hurt me. Because I wasn't the one who was getting attacked. It was my dad. And I remember one Sunday, I was sitting in the PA room, and my dad was standing in the pulpit. Pool pit, and I was sitting there watching, because he had a glass window we, we could see, see in. And I was sitting there watching. And these, these, what he said, to this day, still 
hurts me. He got up there and he said, look folks, I taught my son from right from wrong. I, I taught my son that. My son knows from right from wrong. And what he said next, it hurt me so bad. He said, uh, when my son leave this world, when my son die, he's the one going to have to answer for what he's done. When he stand before the Lord, he's the one going to have to st uh, stand and answer for what he's done. I can't stand for him. I can't stand for him. I can't answer for my son. And when he said those words, it struck me. Then I realized I was doing wrong. But I heard him say those words. I mean, he had talked to me, he punished me, and then it, it didn't did nothing to me. But when he stood in front of that church in that pulpit, he said that, that affected me. Then I realized what I was doing was affecting him. Because he was taking the beating from me. I'm like, are you sitting here telling me when I'm in this world, I'm going to have to answer for me? You sitting here telling me when I stand in front of God and, and, and put the life, I'm going to have to deal with that myself? Are you serious? And it, it has struck me. I mean, it hit me hard when I realized I'm going to have to sell the percentage of the pie. Church, I don't know about you. I have made some bad decisions. I have done some foolish things. And God had to humble me for it. Church, I don't know about you. I, I have done some things that you be disgraced. I don't know about you. But I'm definitely thankful that I got a father yeah. up in heaven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. David, David. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I don't know about you. I'm glad I got a father. Just like the lady, when they said cast the first stones, they dropped the stones. It's hard to accept the percentage of the body. This, this sermon was definitely hard for me. It's Because in this sermon, I had to humble myself. Mm -hmm. When y'all go home, do me a favor. If you don't want to do it today, or sometime this week, look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, did I play a part in this situation? It's easy to point your fingers at whoever. Ask yourself, did I put any logs in the fire? Did I keep kept escalating this situation? Ask yourself that. And if you tell yourself no, you're lying to yourself. I wonder how many times my wife told me I was living in denial. You're lying to yourself. Again, I sell your percentage of the pie. Thank you and God bless.